Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for EMCA's virtual reality training for high-risk engagements from the Hellenic Revolution to today's evolution panel discussion. This event is in association with AHEPA's Hellenic Cultural Commission, Florida's Plato Academy Charter Schools, the Sons of Pericles and Maids of Athena, and Greece, New York. My name is Luke Katzos, EMCA's the East Mediterranean Business Culture Alliance president and chairman of the uh, HEPA Hellenic Cultural Commission and also a HEPA's New York State District Governor. This unique event today will be uh, moderated by technologist Eric Hill and international tax consultant Paul Pavlakos, who are both members of, uh, of uh, HEPA and also EMCA's American Hellenic Revolutionary uh, uh, Bicentennial uh, Committee. Our distinguished panels, uh, panelists are Captain Timothy Hill, Commanding Officer Naval Air Warfare Center Training Systems Division and Naval Support Activity in Orlando, and George Charos, the President and CEO of the uh, National Center for Simulation. Welcome gentlemen to all of you. This panel discussion coincides and is an acknowledgement of Engineers Week 2021 this week, which was founded by the National Society of Professional Engineers in 1951. The week is dedicated to ensuring a diverse and well-educated future engineering workforce by increasing understanding of and interest in engineering and technology careers and education. We are delighted that the Sons of Pericles and Maids of Athena have joined us, as well as Florida's prestigious Plato Academy Charter Schools on this occasion. Over the last year, among our various events, uh, we have highlighted, highlighted various aspects of the Hellenic Revolution of 1821. There's been about a dozen events relating to its uh, various aspects and how they have impacted us nationally and internationally in now the 21st century. These events with multiple speakers have sparked numerous events by others and we are proud of that fact. In 1821, the world was un undergoing the first industrial revolution. This year, 2021, the bicentennial of the Hellenic Republic, we are in the midst of the 21st century, fourth industrial revolution, evolution. We hope today's conversation with experts in the field advances the discussion on where tech augmented training of today's and future warriors and high risk professionals are and where we are heading in the years that follow. Eric and Paul, our moderators, will introduce uh, today's panelists, uh, George Charos and Captain Timothy Hill, but a little bit uh, about our moderators. Eric Hill is a technologist in the third decade of his exceptional career. He holds a bachelor's degree, a science degree in computer engineering from the University of New Hampshire. In the early 1990s, he was involved with the rapid expansion of network infrastructure and distributed management systems that culminated in the dot-com boom. Later, he explored and researched uh, data warehousing and analytics to bolster the understanding of co complex systems analysis. In the last decade, Eric, be Eric became immersed in uh, various areas of cyber and cybersecurity, interfacing with a number of tech industry org organizations such as Garter and Forrester, and has had extensive experience in the defense sector. His significant and acknowledged volunteer efforts have been youth-centered over those years. And uh, also he has been la laser focused on STEM pipeline development, mentorship and empowerment. Since 2014, he has served as the volunteer director of the Diaspora Hellenic Combatives Program that has served the youth of Hellenic communities from Florida across the US into Canada. Since uh, 2016, he has served as the advisor to the Sons of Pericles in Florida. More recently, he has helped orchestrate and escorted numerous youth of the American Hellenic diaspora to visit Hellenic Naval Special Forces in Scalamanga in the Hellenic Republic. 
It was a first of its kind Nostos journey. In addition, he has had a long-term interest in the Hellenic charter school concept as a vehicle of youth development in America. Welcome, Eric. Mm -hmm. Paul uh, Pavlakos uh, is the uh, past Supreme President of the Sons of Pericles, the Ahepa Sons of Pericles advisor for New York and president and founder of Greece 200 to celebrate Elas's 200th anniversary. He has worked for several years to empower the youth of the Hellenic diaspora, establishing initiatives and creating processes which allow for the promotion of Hellenism, service for the community, uh, and also strengthening of ethnic bonds, uh, both in uh, the United States and in Elas. He is also a champion for the recognition of uh, the Hellenic genocide in this country. In his professional life, Paul is a tax associate for international tax at KPMG in Manhattan, New York. He has a strong background in computer science and a demonstrated interest in programming. Paul often works at the intersection of tax and technology, designing automation processes and detailed tax analysis models for both internal and client use. Paul obtained an LL, uh, LLM in taxation from New York University and a Juris Doctor and a Bachelor's in International Relations from Florida State University. Welcome, Paul. Gentlemen, I turn it over to you. Uh, Eric, it's all yours. Sure. Thank you, Lou. I'd like to introduce George Sharos first. <laughs> He's going to do a, a presentation for us. George is currently the president and CEO of the National Center for Simulation. Uh, he oversees all aspects of this 250 plus member organization that represents the modeling and simulation industry. Mr. Charles previously served as chief operating officer of NCS since October, 2012. In his role as CEO, he leads the organization to promote growth of the $6 billion modeling and simulation industry, drive tech transfer of proven defense-based technology to vertical markets, across several industries, I would argue more than that, <laughs> and support public policies that support the development and growth of the industry. Mr. Charos is passionate about NCS extensive STEM education programs to develop the workforce of the future. The Orlando area, where several of us sit today, is the epicenter of the modeling and simulation for the world. For over 20 years, the confluence of industry, military, and university research developed a center of excellence that is unmatched he also serves on a number of advisory boards associated with his position at the National Center for Simulation. For the past two years, Florida Trend Magazine selected him to, to their prestigious Florida 500, a collection of the state's most influential business leaders. Prior to joining NCS, Mr. Charos had a long career in business that began in finance and marketing positions at General Foods Corporation in White Plains, New York. His responsibilities included a broad range of finance strategic marketing positions, <clears throat> including capital budgeting, product development, brand management, and corporate mergers and acquisitions. Subsequently, Mr. Charles served as division controller and director of strategic planning for Darden restaurants. He had financial responsibility for 200 plus restaurants accounting for revenues of over $500 million. Immediately prior to joining NCS, he was founding partner of consulting venture organization that strategically partnered with mid-market companies to solve complex business issues. In addition, the company participated in joint ventures with real estate developers and arranged financing for commercial real estate transactions. He holds both a bachelor's degree and MBA from the University of Central Florida, which you all are here appreciate uh, the university. On a personal note, George is married to Linda Charles and they have a daughter, Sophia, who attends Denison University. His parents are both second generation Greeks running an Italian here, who were founders of Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Church in Orlando. He has been active in the church his entire life, and was the founding president of the Orlando Sons of Pericles, a member of the Sons of Pericles Supreme Lodge, and also served as a member of the Sons National Advisory Board. George, welcome. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate the, uh, the kind and lengthy introduction. You did, you did me well. Um, for those uh, Sons of Pericles and Maids of Athena on this call, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, just to give you a little flashback in my life, those were probably some of the funnest years of my life. Uh, we had a lot of good times in that organization around the country. 
Um, and I will also tell you that I probably in those years learned more about leadership there than I have in any corporate position that I've had. Um, there are some great mentors in that, that organization. Um, I was fortunate enough to have uh, Mr. Louis Logos, who was a National Advisory Board Chairman for years, as, as my own personal mentor. Unfortunately, we, we lost him a couple few months ago. Um, but Louis was great. And uh, everything I've seen uh, Eric doing over the, uh, the past several years uh, with our youth, uh, Eric, you kind of remind me of Louis, so you got big shoes to fill. So um, <laughs> charge on, as the, as the Knights say here at UCF. Um, <laughs> Also, thanks to uh, Lou, Paul, and Eric for hosting this event. I think it's really great that uh, you guys are mentoring our youth and our young professionals. Um, you know, the, the corporate world is hard to navigate, and um, it always helps to have mentors that care about you. So, so thanks what you do, for what you do to our youth and with our youth. Um, with that, let me just transition into a little bit about what we are, what we're all about, a little history, and then we'll go from there. And um, I think... Uh, Costa's going to pop up the slides at any point now. All right, perfect. Um, the National Center for Simulation is uh, the organization I lead. We are an industry trade association that works closely with the modeling and simulation business. Modeling and simulation in the military really got its major start prior to World War II and the ramp up for the invasion of, uh, of Europe. Um, that's when really simulation training came into its own, primarily through the use of flight simulators. Um, after World War II, the Army and the Navy signed a joint collaboration agreement to jointly focus on the development of modeling and simulation as a, as a strategic training tool for the military. They operated out of the North Shore of Long Island in the old Guggenheim Estate from that point until the early 60s where that operation was transferred, both the Army and the Navy, to the Naval Training Center that existing, existed here in Orlando early in the early 60s. Um, fast forward to where we are now in the you know, 2021, 60 years later, Orlando is now ground zero for all military modeling and simulation training. Next slide, please. Simply set, in terms of our mission, is to promote, protect, and set the conditions for growing the $6 billion modeling and simulation community. And when we talk about the $6 billion community, that's basically the sum of all the contracts that go out the door each year from the services and the other government agencies. When you look at it in terms of uh, direct and, econ and direct and indirect economic impact, it's more like $13 billion. So it's a big driver to the state's economy. Um, and the reason that we have that is that tremendous confluence of military academia in the form of the University of Central Florida. For those of you that don't know, the University of Central Florida is the largest university in the country with over 70,000 students. They also graduate more aerospace engineers than any other university in the country. And recently, Aviation Week magazine did a survey of aerospace companies and asked for rankings in two categories. One, which company do you hire the most engineers from? And two, rank them in terms of quality, in terms of the quality that you get of the engineers coming out. UCF is ranked number one for years on the quantity side. And this year, I'm happy to say they rank number two on the quality side, only behind Georgia Tech. So if you think of some of the other prestigious engineering schools in the country, they ranked ahead of all of them. So we have a great resource here for traditional engineering, but also in modeling and simulation. It's only one of two universities in the United States that has a graduate program in modeling and simulation. And having that university next to the research park that houses this base of this joint base with all four military commands, as well as the, uh, the industry and the research park makes that the sixth largest research park in the country and a great uh, setting for all these groups to work together. Next slide, please. So our role, we have four key objectives. One is to advocate to promote and grow the modeling and simulation technologies. We do that through a number of events, networking, communication strategies, and I'll get into that later. Two, pr promote, protect, and grow the Central Florida $6 billion defense joint sector and joints underlined there. And if you look at that Team Orlando logo to the right, um, it's not just a saying, it's a way of life here. It's represents the military branches as well as education, the community and industry as represented by the National Center for Simulation. 
And Captain Hill, like I said, he is going to spend most of his presentation going through how that works. Um, three, promote technology transfer. Um, sounds like Eric knows a little bit about what we're doing there because he says we do more than we say we're doing. Um, we like to hear that. Um, basically, this industry was developed you know, over a long time. There have literally been tens of billions of dollars invested in the technology by the Department of Defense. And not unlike NASA several years ago, where as a result of the uh, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs, there was technology that was developed that, quite frankly, is the reason we're on a Zoom call right now using these machines and carry iPhones, among other things. Um, this simulation technology is very similar in that light. So our mission is to push that out to these various different um, vertical markets. And four, champion and advocate for STEM. And I cannot underestimate the importance of that. That's literally our biggest challenge in the industry, you know, providing for this workforce of the future. Next slide, please. Defense is a huge business in the state of Florida, um, ranked only behind tourism and agriculture. It's the number three industry in Florida. It's a $95 billion business in 2020, up $10 billion from only three years ago. So that tells you how fast it's growing. Next slide, please. Now you understand why it's such a big business in Florida. This map represents all the military installations around the state. There are 26 of them. And Costa, if you could just hit the clicker once, see if this works, perfect. So you see three red boxes in the middle of your, two in the middle of your screen and one in the lower right. Those represent the three strategic military commands that are located in the state of Florida. Over in Tampa, MacDill Air Force Base, we have U.S. Central Command, we have U.S. Special Operating Command, and then down in South Florida, we have the U.S. Southern Command headquartered there. Um, also around all these bases is um, pretty much all areas, all branches of the service operate out of this state of Florida. Um, the black dot in the middle represents where we are in Central Florida, the Central Florida Research Park. And it's the base that Captain Hill commands. Um, the other thing I would point you turn to in terms of strategic resources for this state are there are light blue shaded areas, one off the coast of Jacksonville in Northeast Florida, and one that basically highlights the entire Gulf of Mexico co west of the Florida Peninsula. Those are range complexes that are used for all kinds of military exercises out at sea. They represent over 300,000 square miles of uh, ocean covered space that um, they do stuff above on the sea and below the sea. Um, so when you think of and you hear about the moratorium on drilling in the Gulf, um, you know, you hear about it mostly from the environmental standpoint, but this Gulf range is a very important strategic range to our military. And if Gulf and if drilling were to resume there, it would greatly impact the military to do their training exercises. So that's part of the reason I think it's probably still off limits. Um, next slide, please. This is an overview, just a, a sampling of some of our 270 members. You'll notice we have the typical large prime defense contractors like Lockheed Martin, Collins, General Dynamics, Raytheon's not on the list, but they're a member and, and all the other ones that you could generally think of. Um, Interesting to note that 80% of our members are small business, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, if you think about the technology of modeling and simulation, most of it's software-based. There's a very low barrier to entry in terms of capital investment. Um, and it's also, those are the companies that are more creative, quite frankly, can get things to market a lot faster because they don't have to rely on you know, 12 levels of management to review it. So what typically happens in this industry is these small companies are the ones that come up with the new exciting uh, technology that people like Captain Hill are excited about. If they get to a point where it's to be implemented and grown, they act probably as a subcontractor initially to some of these larger companies. And then there is those few that uh, succeed to the point where these larger companies decide to uh, take them up on an exit strategy and acquire them. Um, the other thing that's interesting about these small businesses in the investment community is since when I first came to this industry in 2012, there was really not much participation in the form of pri private equity or Wall Street money. Um, that has changed substantially. And generally, I've learned is you, you follow the money. If the 
if the money on the street is investing in what you're doing, it's probably a good thing and will probably be around for, for a long period of time. Um, the other thing on this chart that's interesting is there's a couple, you know, it's not all defense oriented. We have medical energy manufacturing companies and some others. But, you know, you look two thirds of the way down that first column and you see a little entertainment park called Disney on there. Um, Disney, as you can imagine, is one giant simulation experience, but that's from the consumer's point of view. What people don't realize is how they use simulation technology to run their park operations and logistics and all their maintenance on their equipment. It's an amazing operation that they have using this technology. We are fortunate enough and that the techno technological head of that division sits on my board as a member of the NCS board of directors. So there is interplay that goes back and forth because we have Disney and we have some other entertainment companies in town like EA Sports that uh, allow them to learn from the military and quite frankly, the military to learn from them. Next slide, please. In terms of the mission of Team Orlando, it's very simple, but very important. Modeling simulation and training saves time, saves time, money, and lives. Very important and very simple. And we try to look, you know, keep focused on that every day. Next slide. I believe the next slide is our video. And if a picture is worth a thousand words, this one minute video is probably worth 10,000 of my words. It's a description of uh, this industry in uh, Florida and how it works and how it fits in and enjoy. This is where the world's largest concentration of simulation industry experts innovate the latest in cutting edge technology. The Orlando region, known for its exceptional experiences, pushes the limits of technology from augmented reality to digital twin simulations made smarter by AI and data analytics that power the ability to plan communities, assess threats, save lives, and educate the next generation. Simulation is part of Orlando's economic foundation. With over 60 years of research and development, a workforce more than 60,000 strong, billions of dollars worth of investment, and an ecosystem supported by a connected infrastructure of specialized centers of excellence, built over decades of advancements in our nation's reliable defense training industry. From the everyday to the exceptional, in Orlando, we create the technology that makes the impossible a virtual reality. Get to know all we have to offer. All right, thank you. That's a uh, piece that's done by the Orlando Economic uh, par Partnership to promote what we do. What I will say about that, hey, if everyone, it looks welcome fun to my channel. This is OpenCV. Oops. Um, if it looks fun on video, it's more fun to participate in in person. Um, I have crashed planes, crashed helicopters, sunk ships, shot people, shot myself. Um, the good news is nobody died, <laughs> no money was lost, and it's Definitely the best and uh, most efficient and realistic way to train short of only the real experience. But uh, it's, there are some amazing things that have incorporated a lot of this technology that we have in the theme park industry, as you see, that has gone into this that uh, allow for our warfighters to be completely immersed in what they do and experience uh, as much as they can before they get to that real live event. And if we can go forward to the slide after the video. Okay, in terms of our going back to our initial goals, promoting what we do. Our signature event every year that we host is the Florida Simulation Summit. We host it in October every year. We partner with the Orange County Mayor's Office and, it's typical, and it takes place at the Orange County Convention Center. Um, obviously this year with COVID, it was a virtual event and we learned a lot of good things by doing it virtually to the point where next year, assuming that COVID is uh, somewhat under control, we will have probably a uh, hybrid of a virtual and a live event. One of the things that we're able to do with the virtual event is have participants and presenters from literally all over the world. And in one panel last year, we had uh, a presenter from Spain, a presenter from South America, and a keynoter from California, all going at the same time. And we had uh, viewers from uh, four different continents watching at the same time. So it provides exposure to us from all over the world. And we do have members internationally from Europe and uh, US and South America and uh, want to, that can only help our collaboration. Even though Orlando is the epicenter of modeling and simulation, it's definitely not the only place it takes place and we can definitely all learn from each other. Um, another event that's uh, very important in this uh, industry is the ITSIC conference, 
That takes place the second of the week immediately following Thanksgiving at the Orange County Convention Center every year. It's the largest military trade, military simulation trade show in the world. They have about 20,000 attendees that show up every year and there's probably 600 exhibits and all those cool things that you saw in our video, you can experience at that conference. It is open to the public. And for those of you that are members of this, all these fine organizations participating in this conference, if you're in Orlando the week after Thanksgiving, get a hold of me, I'll get you a floor pass and you can come in and experience all or some of all of this as much as you want. So look forward to seeing you there. There's a number of other things we do um, in terms of uh, integrating our members. One of the things I'll point to from a business perspective is the uh, PALT conference, which is the Procurement Administrated Leave time, Lead Time Meeting. Those are held monthly or bi-monthly by the Navy and the Army and the Air Force and the Marines in conjunction with each other. That allows all contractors to come into one place, be it a meeting room or a Zoom conference, and ask any and all questions about all the contracts that are out there. And um, it really has done a lot to open up lines of communications. It was a um, pilot program at this base here, and it is being rolled out by the Army and the Navy and other locations across the country based off the success here. Next slide, please. All right. We always talk about protecting this base. Geography matters. If you don't have a base, you don't have contracts, you don't have an economic impact. Um, several years ago when this base was established at the research park, Central Florida Research Park, the way it was established is like I mentioned earlier, the Army and the Navy were collaborating in a small uh, facility located on a, uh, a Naval Training Center that was in uh, closer to downtown Orlando. That Naval Training Center in the late 90s was uh, closed as a result of a, a BRAC base realignment and closure action. But prior to that, they had gotten some military construction money to build themselves a new headquarters on that Naval Training Center base. Well, the university had already started the uh, graduate program in modeling and simulation. The city's forefathers really wanted to have a, a first class uh, office park adjacent to the university. And for those of you like Lou that are in real estate, you know if you're gonna have a successful real estate development, you have to have a successful and an anchor tenant that'll draw other tenants to the complex. So the, our forefathers were wise enough to believe that this modeling and simulation could be just that. So they approached the Navy who was getting ready to build this building with construction money they had already received and said, if you build, if we give you the land in the middle of this park, will you build your building there and establish the base here? The Navy took them up on it. And, you know, here we are 30 years later with a, uh, a full-fledged research park. What, what is shown on this slide are pictures of what are known as partnership buildings. And what these partnership buildings represent are about a half a million square feet of office space at a cost of $150 million, born 100% by the state of Florida and the University of Central Florida. Um, these buildings are how, house both military personnel and university research personnel. So the beauty is they get to work together and collaborate early on in projects. But the other beauty to the military is they get to live in these buildings for only their share of common area maintenance costs and utilities. They don't pay any traditional rent, which puts their cost profile on, a, on, a, on an equal footing of being, in an, of being in a regular facility or a regular base, which really protects them from that, uh, that draw by the green nightshade accountants to what to get them into lower cost uh, office space. Um, but this collabor collaboration has been unmatched. And I'll, I'll point you down to the four pictures at the bottom of the screen. Those are our most re recent acquisitions, partnership four and partnership five. Over, three, over a three year period a few years ago, we talked the uh, state legislature into appropriating $42 million to expanding this partnership footprint. And we purchased these two buildings, partnership four and partnership five. Partnership four is, is an original facility that was built by SAIC Corporation. We were lucky enough to get our hands on it. It has a traditional high base space on the first floor that you see in the uh, third picture from the right where a lot of collaboration can be done. And I'm not gonna uh, steal Captain Hill's thunder on that. Um, the picture to the, in between those two pictures is the ground open, the um, dedication ribbon cutting that was held a couple of years ago. 
That's uh, me with the former president of UCF and the commanding general of Army Futures Command out of Austin, Texas, cutting that ribbon. As a result of getting this facility, which we had just hoped to uh, pull the military out of commercial space, we attracted the Army Futures Command Synthetic, and Train Synthetic Training Environment Division to move their headquarters here and collaborate out of this building. And then in the Partnership 5 building, which is to the uh, bottom right of your screen, um, which is literally located around the corner from the other building, um, we have the Army Persistent Cyber Training Environments headquarters in there. And they can do all kinds of simulation training to uh, defend against any kind of cyber threat they may incur. Um, it's a closed environment. And um, between those two new groups coming here, that's probably another billion dollars in uh, direct uh, economic output coming out of those buildings. Next slide, please. We also advocate for technology transfer, as I said before. That box in the bottom represents the Team Orlando magic, which uh, again, Captain Hill's gonna explain. But uh, you can see some of the industries that are highlighted there. Um, what's not really shown there is if you think about modeling and simulation, um, when everybody thinks about simulation, they think about flight simulators, they think about driver simulators, they think about the toys. The modeling side of that business is what's the math and the computer science that's behind all that. That's the artificial intelligence, the data analytics, the digital twin technology. All of that is what's gonna drive in the future is what is gonna be known as smart cities. And you will be seeing those pop up all over the country. And this is the technology that's behind it. Also, for example, artificial intelligence is really what was uh, the driving factor to get these vaccines to market from big pharma faster than they normally would. It really, using that artificial intelligence, they can simulate testing for medical drugs and all the phase one and phase two trials and all the iterations that come back from that. And it reduces the number of iterations in terms of patient trials, which speeds up the process, which you know, fortunately for us, we have uh, three different vaccines on the market. Next slide, please. This is kind of an overview of what we do for STEM. And to tell you how important STEM is to us, we have an education and workforce development committee. And on that committee, we have 200 volunteers from our 270 members. So that tells you how important they think it are. They think it is. We do STEM education training from uh, elementary school all the way up through uh, you know, postgraduate school. Um, most of what we do is in the high school and middle school programs. We have developed a modeling and simula simulation certification exam that high schoolers take, which give them a leg up on um, either internships or college applications or quite or in many cases um, directly into entry level jobs. Um, we do a lot of summer programs, out of school programs where people actually send their kids to the base. Um, that has concentrated mainly in the middle and high school arenas. Um, we do have an exciting addition on the elementary school arena coming hopefully this summer. And uh, as you can see to the right side of that screen, that industrial base, you know, the average salary of the people working in a research park is about $80,000 a year. For those of you in New York, that may not sound impressive, but for those of us in Florida, that's over twice our uh, average wage. So it's a High tech job, great jobs, high salaries, very important to our economy. And um, it's something that we support greatly. And I believe if you go to the next slide, that's the end of my formal presentation. Please follow us on our website. We are uh, all over social media, particularly in LinkedIn. Follow us there, you can see what we're doing. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or uh, are interested in joining us. And with that, I'll turn it back to Eric and Paul for the next part of the show, and I'll be back later when you can ask some questions. Thank you. Thank you, George. And I'm gonna pass the baton to Paul. <laughs> sure, uh, thank, first of all, thank you, George, for the presentation. I'm, I'm looking forward to asking some questions later. Um, as somebody who's recently made the move from Florida to New York, I can testify that the cost of living adjustment is a real thing. So I do wanna discuss young professional opportunities in Florida, because I think there's a lot to be, to be discussed there. But um, Without further ado, I do want to get to uh, Captain Hill's presentation. So I'd like to introduce our next panelist, uh, Captain Timothy M. Hill, 
the commanding officer in the U.S. Navy for Naval Air Warfare Center Training Systems Division and Naval Support Activity in Orlando, Florida. Uh, Captain Hill earned a bachelor's in systems engineering with the U.S. Naval Academy class of 1992 and was subsequently designated a Naval Flight Officer. After initially qualifying in the S-3B Viking, he transitioned to the F-A-18F Super Hornet after the S-3B sundown. He completed operational sea tours with the VS-30 Diamond Cutters, the VS-31 Top Cats, and in command of the VFA-32 Swordsman. He has made four operational deployments supporting NATO operations in the former Yugoslavia, enforcing the United Nations no-fly zone and other sanctions in Iraq, as well as in support of operations Iraqi Freedom, Enduring Freedom, and New Dawn. Ashore, Captain Hill served as a flight instructor and as a flight test officer and instructor. He was assigned to the headquarters staff at U.S. Special Operations Command, the F-35 Lightning II Joint Program Office, and was the director of the Long Range Anti-Surface Missile Deployment Office. He reported to his current duty station as executive officer of the Naval Air Warfare Center Training Systems Division and Naval Support Activity in Orlando in June 2016 and assumed command in November 2018. Captain Hill has accumulated over 3,200 flight hours in 32 different aircraft models, and he has logged nearly 750 carrier arrested landings. He is a graduate of the Air Command and Staff College, holds master's degrees in systems engineering from Johns Hopkins University and in inter international relations from Choi, Choi University, and is a designated acquisition professional. So Captain Hill, uh, without further ado, welcome. Paul, thanks so much for the intro and thanks to Lou and Eric and yourself for uh, hosting this event and inviting me to, to share our message a little bit today. Uh, like any good aviator, I'm gonna start with a video. So uh, Costas, if you could uh, roll the first video and just through uh, time three minutes, please. stop the advance on our bill. I've directed our military to take targeted strikes against ISIL terrorist convoys should they move toward the city. Okay, so the president made that statement last night. Now the bombs are actually falling. That's right. Two F-18s from the George H.W. Bush carrier uh, took part in the strike. President Obama today said U.S. airstrikes targeting Islamic militants in northern Iraq are proving to be successful. Keep 
Awesome. Thanks, Costas. So, you know, I could sit there and watch that all day and all night because I'm an aviator and I eat that stuff up. But hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, that's a, a video that is put together every year as the, uh, the strike fighter community, the community that flies the F-18 and the F-35 and the Navy comes together. And it gives you a little idea of the, the danger and risk involved in uh, naval aviation. And uh, what enables every one of those people to do what they just did, what you saw there, and a whole lot more that you didn't see is the training we do right here in Central Florida. So I, th I think we could start with a little bit of the so what up front there. If you could push the slides up, we'll uh, jump right into that. And as uh, George mentioned, uh, Team Orlando is the grouping of all of the DOD commands along with our industry and academic uh, counterparts, primarily represented by National Center for Simulation for Industry and the University of Central Florida for the academic partners. Next slide, please. One more. Thank you. That's perfect. So our mission fundamentally across all four and now five with Space Force joining us services is really to make the warriors that man up our airplanes, our ships, and our uh, ground assault vehicles, and every other type of uh, combat that we do better at their trade. We don't build the, the toys, you know, the airplanes, the weapons, the, the ships, the tanks, but we build the people that man those things. And uh, as George mentioned, all four, soon to be five, as, uh, as Space Force gets a, a footprint down here, services are represented right here in Orlando as the core of that uh, mission to do that for our uh, US forces. We also share uh, partnerships here locally with the uh, Veterans Health Administration through their SimLearn facility that's uh, here in Central Florida, along with the Department of Homeland Security who has a presence here to leverage what we do. Next slide, please. So this is a different look at those buildings and facilities that George mentioned earlier. Um, it's centered somewhat on the, uh, the DeFores building and the annex that are mentioned right there in the uh, center of the chart. Those are uh, the bases or the bases buildings. And then all those partnership buildings that George mentioned as long as well as some commercial real estate that we also occupy are all right there. As you can see at the very top of the chart, the University of Central Florida is uh, nestled up above us. So the, the largest university in the nation right next to the second smallest Navy base that there is. And we there, puts about 3,000 DOD, Department of Defense personnel working right next to this 70,000 person and student behemoth of a university. And so we like to talk about our very small team with a huge global impact around the, uh, around the nation, around our service forces. What uh, may or may not be easy to see here is that most of these buildings, with the exception of uh, Partnership 5, are very walkable to get between. So our ability to collaborate amongst the services and amongst uh, the University of Central Florida folks is unmatched fundamentally. The buildings that you also can see that aren't marked are primarily our industry partners and such. So they kind of are nestled right around the, uh, the base there. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about Partnership 4 towards the end of the brief. But just recognize that all those things on the inset box to the left, there are different organizations from uh, DOD or UCF. That are, uh, that are all part of the collaborative alliance that we have here in the research park to move forward, all, so, all focused on modeling, simulation, and training, and the enabling uh, technologies that go with that. Next slide, please. So here's the first story we're gonna tell about a specific device. Uh, I did not include the video for this one today, but I would encourage you to Google Battle Stations 21, and you'll find about a three minute uh, bit from Wolf Blitzer of CNN, where he went and visited Battle Stations 21, which is a, 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 our largest simulating simulation device that we have in the field. It's located at the Navy's boot camp that's now located up at Great Lakes, Illinois, just north of Chicago. Battle Stations 21 is a 9 tenth scale destroyer. That's the picture of it there on the left. It sits in 90,000 gallons of water inside a building and attached to 100,000 plus square feet of training space on the back side of that uh, ship. Because what you can't tell from that picture, there's only half a ship there. The other half is a building that has a lot of training space in it. The first time that I visited this uh, uh, particular trainer, was uh, roughly uh, 2009 when I was getting ready to go be a squadron commanding officer. 
and they take us all up there to see where the product, our young sailors are made. So we would understand what goes into building those sailors. And, and even after having a few deployments under my belt and stuff, when I walked out on the simulated pier that you see in the picture on the left, things looked, smelled, sounded, and, and, and such the way it should for a, a ship on the pier in Norfolk, Virginia, which is one of our East Coast hubs uh, up there. When you go on board the ship, similarly, the sights, the sounds, the smells are all what they should be. So it's because it's all about suspension of disbelief and putting you in an environment where you believe you are where the simulator makes you be. So if that worked for me, how much better does it work on one of our young 17 or 18 year old recruits that has never been on a ship before? We put them on this and they embark on a journey where uh, they get underway from Norfolk. They sail up the James River to pick up some cargo. They get to uh, uh, the base up there at Jamestown to pick up their cargo. Uh, the buildings on the pier have been flipped around to where now they look like Jamestown rather than, uh, I'm sorry, Yorktown rather than uh, Norfolk. They unload some cargo onto the ship, another team building activity, and then they get back underway again, sailing back down the James River, at which time they're attacked. Uh, they start having the worst night of their life as inside of that training space, they start fighting real fires, they're fighting real flooding, and they're going through uh, twisted up spaces like the one you see on the right there that are meant to mimic, in this case, the, uh, the mess deck, the uh, eating area on the USS Cole when it was bombed. And they have to navigate through there, not in the light like it is in that picture, but in the dark with strobe lights that are going to simulate electrical arcing, with smoke that's being pumped in there, and find a way through that space to get to a, a, a shipmate that's been trapped in his bunk. They have to rescue that shipmate and get them to a medical for attention. Unfortunately for them, once they get through this space and into that uh, sleeping compartment, the, the exit that they just came through closes behind them. So they have to find another way out of that space. Uh, and so you can imagine a whole night of these kinds of problems is very impactful on our young sailors. And if you Google that video I told you about, you'll see how uh, impactful it is when you see for yourself the pride the, 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 on their faces, the tears running down from their eyes and such once they complete this, which is their crucible event at the end of boot camp. So why do I bring this up and why do I talk about it? Well, one, there's the obvious answer of the training that we make here. The one that you probably haven't guessed yet is the fact that we're on Orlando where everybody thinks about theme parks and Mickey Mouse and rides and that sort of thing. Uh, there's a connection there because we actually partnered with one of the contractors that help builds, helps build rides out at the theme parks to build this particular uh, uh, device up at Great Lakes. That whole idea of suspension of dis disbelief where we got down to a level of detail where there's bird droppings and oil stains on the, uh, the deck of that pier that you see there. So it looks real. You hear the sounds from the buoys that are uh, rocking back and forth in the waves and the bells going off on them. You hear the sound of the water lapping up against the ship hull. All these things that they think about that are attention to detail that we might not have thought about because we don't build things like Pirates of the Caribbean or the Incredible Hulk or King Kong on a daily basis. The other thing we don't think a lot about because in typical form, is that we typically push a few people through a simulator at a time. As an aviator, I grew up in simulators and it's typically the pilot and the other air crew, maybe four or five, maybe as many as eight in a simulator at once. This thing's pushing through 30 to 45,000 students annually, annually. So in 10 years, the time from the first time that I saw this until the time that I joined the NOC-TSD team and went back to it, we had pushed the entire size of the Navy through this simulator. That's a big number if you think about it. Um, and, and then more importantly, that ride, that simulator here is running 55 zero weeks every year. It is only down for two weeks for maintenance every year. Because if it doesn't perform on a given night for a particular class, we introduce a blockage into the pipeline that has to keep flowing in order to keep the new people flowing out to the fleet. Uh, and providing the manpower that's needed. So we learned a lot about availability. We learned a lot about throughput and ultra high reliability from partnering with the theme parks in uh, building this particular device. Again, I'd highly uh, recommend Googling Battle Stations 21 and taking three and a half minutes of your time to watch uh, a little story about this and about what it takes to make a Navy sailor. Next slide, please. 
So our focus areas as, as a command kind of look like what I'm showing you here. And this is uh, you know, remarkably similar for the rest of the Team Orlando commands. This is obviously a Navy centric view today, but uh, I can tell you that the Army and the Air Force and the Marine Corps are doing the same thing. So the first thing we do is we're worried about making readiness for our, so our forces that are out along the waterfront today, getting ready to deploy in defense of our nation. The, regardless of what's going on to include COVID, we are still deploying troops over the horizon to uh, support combat operations and peacekeeping operations worldwide. That has not stopped. And so we have a, a very large footprint of devices and personnel that are out around the world at the bases where our sailors are so that they can be trained and keep going. And that's our number one priority out there. Next, we look at expanding our fleet's capability and looking at what tomorrow is, is gonna bring for us. Mostly for us, that means looking at things and uh, about how to allow our forces to train like they fight. Most of our devices, most of our equipment are bought as platforms. So I buy an F-18 aircraft or an E-2 aircraft, but that is not how we train and not how we fight. We fight with those things together. So we're working on ways to allow us to train in that same manner. Uh, one of the biggest parts of that is doing what we call live virtual constructive training solutions, where we allow an aircraft to be in the air and, a, and another air crew to be in a simulator on the deck. And those folks can train together and see it seam seamlessly. Uh, there's a lot of good reasons for that. One is the fact that it costs about a tenth as much to be in a simulator as it does to be in the aircraft. Uh, certainly, as George mentioned earlier in his uh, pitch, you can crash an airplane with no consequences in the simulator. That's not quite true in the air. And that's true of pretty much everything we simulate. Uh, there's no do-overs in the air. You can't just hit pause and quit flying all of a sudden. In a simulator, we absolutely can. And so the ability to get a, a rapid buildup of reps and sets in a simulator is something we just can't do anywhere else. The other thing is that there are capabilities that we have in our weapon systems that we might not want to show an adversary. And so training in a simulated environment allows us to use all those capabilities without being observed and, and keep those secrets a secret. So that's an important part of what we do. The next big focus area for us is lifelong learning. And really that it should be career long learning, really looking at the idea of a sailor that, that comes in the door and we teach them a little bit to get them out, to, out the door into their ship or their squadron and allow them to do the job they need to be able to do and then build up on that over their career to continue getting more and more proficient so that they can become the steely eyed ninja they need to be when they're the senior person out there uh, and such. There is a lot of technology behind that. First of all, there's the science of learning itself, understanding how people learn. That's very much a soft skill and not in the engineering side of the world, uh, but is a foundational thing to what we do. And then there's things that have everything to do with engineering and technology, such as uh, artificial intelligence and data analytics that allow us to get inside the curriculum and understand how people are learning and that they actually are learning and achieving proficiency by what they do. Uh, and that all goes into baking this curriculum together so that it centers around the individual sailor uh, out there to make them into what we need them to be and as proficient as we need them to be to, to defend our nation. Um, cybersecurity is a very big part of what we do. Oftentimes, if you were able to get inside of the, the simulators, you would find more information there because you have all the environmental data that we simulate. Uh, than you would in the actual aircraft or the actual weapon system or whatnot. So both defending cyber uh, defending our systems from a cyber threat, as well as teaching our operators how to operate in a cyber environment uh, are big things for us. And then internal to our uh, command and internal to Team Orlando, working to foster an ecosystem innov of innovation. I'm going to talk much more about that on my get off the stage slide. And then uh, looking internally, just like a lot of other folks do, to uh, make sure that we're having data-driven decisions inside our organization rather than just uh, seat of the pants feel. Next slide, please. So some trends to show you here, and then we're going to uh, pop to another video after that. We're seeing a lot of use as uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality are coming to their uh, a much more mature level. They're just not uh, they're not just an, a novelty any longer. They're actually capable of producing some high fidelity training environments. 
And so we're starting to see those come in so that we don't have to have these giant dome simulators that take up a whole, you know, a giant space in a huge building. And maybe we can start doing something just in the, uh, the ready room out on the ship in, a, in an individual ready room chair uh, or whatnot. Those are things that are coming along. They're starting to be adopted. Uh, up in the top, you'll see a game-based training, taking some of the environments that you have seen historically for things like Fortnite or pick your EA sports game uh, or whatever, and taking those same environments with the fidelity that they bring and bringing them into our interactive courseware, which is that picture in the top center. Uh, that's a, a, an artificial uh, running mate, which is what we call someone that's a senior person that's taking you around the ship to teach you. Uh, teaching someone how a littoral combat ship works, and they do all of their training in the virtual environment before they deploy forward to meet their ship overseas. On the on the right there is another multiplayer uh, gaming environment where all those screens link together into a single environment, in that case to be a, a Virginia class submarine torpedo room and allow multiple sailors to go in there and do their jobs in a linked environment all stitched together in Unity software, which is the same, one of the two game engines you would see pretty much any game out there built on today. Um, that gives us a lot of opportunity to have cost uh, avoidance by building it in a, in a cheaper environment, but by the same token, again, being able to do things in a much more high fidelity manner than we might be able to with real hardware and do things uh, that would otherwise cost us a lot of money in a very uh, uh, high fidelity, cheap, safe sense. Down on the bottom, you'll see another one. I'm actually gonna play a video on it in a second, but mixed modalities so that you see these three different pictures represent three different stations on board an aircraft carrier. And you can see the, uh, the gentlemen there in the uh, bottom center are in front of very large displays because uh, they're simulating looking out the windows on an aircraft carrier flight deck. And so they would naturally have this full glass view in front of them of the world. So that's the modality they get to learn that their particular job in this team. Uh, the young lady in the, uh, the next picture to the right is in a flight deck uh, position. So she's in virtual reality with uh, hand controllers because she's got to give hand signals to the aircraft and such. And then uh, the gentleman down in the uh, lower right is a, a landing signal officer. So someone who helps the aircraft get back aboard the, uh, the aircraft carrier safely. And so his displays are, uh, you know, representing the displays that he would have in front of him out on the aircraft carrier. All of those three stations operating in exactly the same linked environment so they can train as a team, just as they would work as a team out on the ship. Next slide, please. Perfect. And we'll just play this one all the way through. carrier flight deck operating environments considered one of the most hazardous working environments in the world for a very good reason. There are so many hazards, there are so many risks on the flight deck, there are so many things that have to be second nature, that have to be ingrained in every individual sailor that's operating on the flight deck. So having a simulator that allows us to tie the full flight deck team and all the, the key uh, decision makers, supervisors, doers and watch stations together uh, and trained to that in a virtual environment is just fantastic. In order to meet that need, the Flight Deck Crew Training Expansion Pack system is built to be an expandable framework of trainers that allow each team to be built and added on so there's no stovepipe training. One of the main teams that was built for this was the primary flight control team. They're a pivotal part because they link both launch and recovery of the aircraft on the flight deck and link all the other teams together. Landing Signal Officer Team was also built. They're in charge of recovery and we've also built Catapult Launch Team. So having been a former both LSO and a mini boss who's worked up in tower, I've been really excited to see this come online. This will allow us really to demonstrate some uh, operations that these uh, air bosses will see because currently it's only classroom instruction via lectures. This is the first simulator of this kind. We've never been able to integrate so many different aspects of the flight deck together and be able to do workups and being able to send people periodically before going out to sea is gonna make us so much safer and get refreshed and actually be proficient and current before we actually launch real aircraft. I think it's gonna be perfect. The submission for this training expansion pack project was submitted to the Tech Solutions program from a lieutenant at the Landing Signal Officer School who was familiar with some existing technology developments being performed elsewhere at ONR. Tech Solutions is a program within the Office of Naval Research Global that's funded annually to develop technologies to a prototype form uh, in a rapid response fashion 
based on submissions directly to us from any fleet member or any force member. ONR Tech Solutions helped us throughout the way uh, with transition partner finding and helping us understand how to best get this routed up through the fleet to take it from prototype status to a trainer of record status. I can see this technology going a long way, uh, so it's going to be great and we're looking forward to it. Uh, hopefully we can get this uh, locked down as a uh, program of record for the future and expand it to you know various other fleet concentration sites. I don't know that anything can ever replace the full chaos that is a flight deck, but this is a very close second. Um, and it's going to be invaluable to use as a refresher training for aircrew. So while we're bringing the slides back up and moving to the next slide, then I will say a couple of things. You know, one, we, we didn't have a device like that before, as you heard some of the folks in that video saying. And we used to take people out on the flight deck, the most dangerous, busiest place to work in the world and teach them by on the job training out there. And now we've got a way to buy that risk down and get them at some exposure and experience before they hop into that job. Uh, secondly, you know, we talk a lot about how we partner with industry partners to build solutions. We do most of our work when George talks about the $6 billion of work that the four services bring through the research park every year in order to build training solutions. Most of that is with our industry partners. What you just saw there, training expansion packs, is one that we actually built in-house. And that young uh, engineer, Courtney McNamara, that you saw there is a national asset member of our team that uh, was one of the team that worked to build that in-house through their own coding and stuff, doing the exact same kind of stuff that folks are doing over at EA Sports or anywhere else to build games like that. So it's a pretty uh, impressive ability to do that. Uh, we can only do a little bit of that, and it's typically for niche solutions that need to be there fast, uh, really fast without contracting and such, and only for low quantities, but it's an important part of what we do. So I uh, might get off the stage slide here before we can get into a little bit of a back and forth discussion is, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about all the innovations come in. What we've recognized over time is a couple of things that one, we're in a different world than uh, was even the case 10 years ago as it relates to uh, threats around the world. Uh, we used to be in much, uh, much more of a hegemonic kind of uh, society, you know, sort of world where the U.S. was in the lead clearly and everybody else was a distant second. That is not the case anymore. And not all of those uh, actors that are peers and near peers now uh, believe in some of the freedoms that we believe in. Uh, so with that, we need to step up our pace of increasing our capability. We've recognized that as a department and such. We've also recognized, kind of shown by that graph in the upper left on this particular chart, that the federal government does not drive innovation any longer. Uh, private industry owns that by at least a three and a half to one margin over us. And so it is absolutely imperative that we in defense latch on to that innovation and leverage it. Uh, that's been difficult in the past because you would typically have companies that would specialize in defense solutions or specialize in commercial solutions and not a lot that went back and forth across that divide. A lot of it is because we put a lot of overhead on companies as the DOD to work with us in the way we contract things and some of the requirements we put on folks. So we are doing making a big, massive effort across DOD to be an easier partner to work with. Um, by the same token, how do we tap into that? that non-traditional market. Um, each service has done something a little bit different. In the Navy, we've done what we call the tech bridge network. And we've recognized that there, was, there were operating innovative ecosystems around the Navy already that we didn't need to go create those. We just needed to link them so that they could share assets, they could share problems, they could share best practices. And uh, right here at NOC TSD, we have one of those tech bridge locations, the Central Florida Tech Bridge. Uh, as we set our tech bridge up, we did what we always do. As George says, it's a way of life for us. We went joint with it. And so uh, the Central Florida Tech Grove is what we call the physical uh, space that is now ready for operation in partnership for. It's run by what we call a PIA, a Partnership Intermediary Agreement with uh, the UCF Research Foundation that allows UCF to act on our behalf to interface with, uh, with innovators out there and to do things in this space that we could not do on our own in order to make it much easier for folks to access us and uh, the things we need. It was put in partnership for on purpose 
so that it would be easy access for non-DOD folks. You won't have to go through all the security stuff to come on base. Uh, it's meant to be open architecture. George had shown some of those high base spaces in partnership for in his slides. The pictures you see here are from uh, Softworks, a very similar space located in Ybor City in Tampa that uh, Headquarters Special Operations Command operates. And it's a very similar concept to what we have. It's, it's open architecture, so it can be easily reconfigured for different uses uh, to have either joint projects that we're working on with industry and academic partners, or to bring in things like a prize challenge or a tech talk and have community gatherings. The whole idea is to take that notion of Team Orlando of, and all the services collaborating together and take it from a high level collaboration of amongst the leadership down to an organic grassroots coordination and create that organic community of people sharing or sharing ideas that's deepening our ecosystem, but also pulling in non traditional partners, such as, for instance, the game startup companies in downtown Orlando, the fintech companies that we have in downtown Orlando and pull those into our ecosystem even across the I-4 corridor to Tampa or the other way over to the Space Coast and really bring in best of breed innovations to solve the problems that we need to get solved in our case for training, but across the Navy for a much wider problem set out there. So we're pretty excited about this. We opened it with a soft open back in December with some virtual events. It's uh, physically ready for business now. Uh, our Chief of Naval Operations, the head of the Navy is gonna come down and see this this week. We're pretty excited to show it off. And as soon as uh, COVID allows, we're going to start having some, uh, some events in there in, in a physical presence as well. So we're pretty excited about that. And I think with that, we can uh, tear down the, uh, the slides and go into the conversation. So uh, Eric and Paul, back to you guys. And thank you once again for the platform. Eric, uh, unmute yourself. <laughs> This is great. M much of what we're discussing, I was thinking about is this, the intersection of personality, technology, and culture. So I wanted to go back a little bit to the culture because there's something to pull out of the hat here, Captain Hill. Can you share your relationship to Greece, the Hellenic Republic? <laughs> yeah, so uh, as we were talking a, a couple of weeks ago, the, uh, the one port of call that I have been into on every deployment that I've made, it was, uh, has been Suda Bay there in Crete. And so, uh, Every deployment I've made, I've gone into Greece and I've had a great time every time I was there. I mean, that's a great connection. And I think from my end, uh, George, George, I had a question for you actually on the note of the Sons of Pericles. Um, you, you mentioned you were a past Supreme Secretary, founding member of the, uh, the Orlando chapter. And you also mentioned, and I think we try to push this now, the leadership that it builds. And in this context of simulation and training, I think in, on a high level, the Sons of Pericles is a little bit of simulation and training for any industry and in any career. So I was curious if you could elaborate on kind of the leadership skills and different things that you learned in the Sons of Pericles that you feel have helped you or you apply even today. Sure. Um, probably the biggest thing I learned is really how to work with people and how to influence people. Um, you know, when I was in the Sons of Pericles, there was no internet. Um, so a lot of it was done, you know, really face to face or on the phone. And, um, you also have to realize that you're operating in a nonprofit environment. These, you know, they're not getting paid for what they do. So you really learn a lot about motivation. Um, and you also learn, I learned a lot about how, how you train future leaders, which there's a real parallel to the military. Um, you know, there's, a, there's steps that you go through in the sons of Pericles, you identify, um, as well as the maids of Athena. Um, you, you identify uh, who your future leaders are at a very young age and you work with those people. And um, that's been the biggest thing really is the influence and the, uh, the management of people though. Let me ask you guys a question. We talked about other nations who are involved in, uh, in modeling and simulation. Uh, who are the leaders? Who are the uh, international leaders in simulation and modeling? Uh, and how do they rank in comparison to where we are? And, and what do you see the trajectory of some of these nations in that field? I'll speak a little bit in terms of the, uh, the organizational structure. So we have the, uh, like I mentioned, the big uh, it's a conference that happens here in November. That's the big U.S. simulation conference. There is a complementary organization called ETSA, the European Training and Simulation Organ Association. It's based out of London that we are uh, 
reciprocal members with. And they sort of manage that European, uh, it's called ITAC, and they rotate that conference around different cities every year. Um, unfortunately, last year we didn't have it because of COVID. Um, but there are a number of countries that are involved. Um, I will tell you that, um, you know, we still like to think of ourselves as leaders, but, uh, you know, we have a huge for, foreign military sales program where we sell this technology to our allies overseas. And maybe, Captain Hill, if you want to jump in on that piece of it and look at it from your end. Yeah, I think, you know, George, I, I you know, very parochially say that we're the best in that. And, and, I, and I think about it in more of an outcome kind of perspective, right? Not necessarily the nuts and bolts, but in terms of the overall training and proficiency, there, there's still nobody out there that can touch what we do in terms of how we train our, our you know, nation's warriors. The one advantage, I, and well, and to George's point, what probably backs that up is I have yet to see a platform out there where when we sell this weapon or this aircraft or this ship, they don't want the training that, that the U.S. You know, sailors, Marines, airmen, or soldiers have to go with it. Um, now, that said, I will say that the advantage that some of the, in particular, smaller forces, smaller um, countries have over us is that with that size, they can afford to be a little more agile and nimble than, than we can. So their ability to adopt things more quickly sometimes, uh, the, you know, there are places that do live LVC, live virtual constructive more and better than we do today because they just don't need the same scale that we need. So it's a mix. Yeah. And then I would add on, you know, we talk about STEM education and really, you know, getting our youth up to speed. Um, here's a kind of a good example to understand where we are on that. So the University of Central Florida complete, com competes in these uh, national computing contests, uh, both, both nationally and internationally. And probably more often than not, they either win the national competition or they're in the top three. And then they take those top five national winners and they compete internationally. And more often than not, the Russians are the ones that win at that young age. So um, just a little, you know, a <laughs> little humbleness out there that, uh, you know, there's always room to grow. How is the CCP doing in comparison? Because you hear a lot about uh, their technologies, whether it's uh, their own or somebody else's. Uh, do you see uh, gaps there? Do you see, um, let's say, speeds of where countries are going? Or how about Israel, for example? How are they doing? Oct, I'll leave that to you. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll stay away from specific assessments of specific countries and such and just, and just say that I think what we're seeing is maybe two things. I'll, I'll stand by what I said a minute ago in terms of um, for the scale we have, and the outcome that we get, we it's hard to beat us. Uh, there are some out there that for a smaller scale can, can do pretty well um, uh, and such. And then the other thing I guess I'll, I'll throw on top of that is that the information age has made everything uh, uh, and some of the technologies that I showed has been a great leveler in all this. And so anyone that had an advantage before or seeks to get an advantage now it's, it's a harder thing to maintain an advantage because technology has been leveled, you know, greatly across the board. Along those lines, Captain Hill, uh, of course, we're hopefully rising and say whether, uh, where there's darkness, there is the light out of the, out of the, out of the COVID-19 pandemic. How has that affected Navy training in your view? So, so it's interesting. Uh, you know, I think, you know, we were talking a little bit before the panel today that from an, an acquisition core and industry perspective, you know, the, the teams have worked really hard to get past that and, and, and have not missed a beat. I think my, all my counterparts here would say they had, you know, from the other services would say they had a great year last year and didn't miss a beat other than a couple of weeks of transition from, you know, normal in the office face-to-face -face work to the same thing that all of us are doing, which is either uh, a lot of telework or some kind of hybrid in between thing. As it relates to the training itself, um, and even for that matter, the operational deployments, uh, some things have had to change. You know, people come up and they go to boot camp and they show up and they go into quarantine for a period of time, just like we saw for the NHL or the NBA or some of the other sports uh, leagues before they went into their uh, major seasons and, and their, you know, a championship and stuff. So that kind of stuff has changed. 
we've had to be a little more conscious. Like uh, I'll give you an example, virtual reality goggles, you know, something you put on your head that everybody, you know, I'll get into them. And then Eric, you would go next. Then George would go. We didn't think at all about cleaning those things in between individual users before uh, touch screens that you do with your hands and such. We've now figured out, hey, there are gloves you can get that you can wear and still get touched to work with that. So again, you can be more sanitary with that. So those are the little kind of things. But in general, the training has continued on as the training has continued to as it's needed to carry on. In, in terms of education, for the young people who are listening to us, what, you know, what, what should they be doing, let's say, when they're, they're going to the university level? What type of, uh, what type of uh, engineering courses should they take? What type of industry should they go into that relate to what we're talking about in terms of simulation and modeling? In other words, which universities also are in the forefront of this, besides, besides in, see, in uh... Florida? <laughs> Well, obviously, there's a lot of good schools out there. Um, one of the slides that we have that uh, didn't make it in this presentation, which is really interesting, is where we are located between the University of Central Florida, the University of Florida, the University of South Florida, some private universities, as well as uh, state colleges. Within an hour and a half drive of where we are, there are a half a million college students. Um, so the competition is fierce out there. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, you think of the traditional, you know, computer scientists, engineers. Um, there are a lot of people that can make a good living in this field with a trade, with a technical college or trade school um, education. You don't have to be a PhD to, to do well in this business. Um, there, there are places for all people related to STEM. And then there are places for liberal arts. A lot of these uh, learning tools are developed by psychologists and educators. And, uh, and then, you know, Captain Hill will tell you from the, uh, the contracting side of the business, you know, we need lawyers, accountants, finance people, and uh, contract negotiators. So um, there's, there's a role for pretty much everybody. I'd say the ones that drive the ship, you know, I worked in two big marketing companies and it were the marketing people that drove the ship. You know, in this, in this area, it's the engineers and the computer scientists. Yeah, and I'll, I'll pile on and say that, you know, hey, when I was, you know, decades ago, when I was sitting in that uh, seat of a high school student that was thinking about that and stuff, I think the, the notion that was planted in my head was you're going to go pick a major and that's going to define what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And, and certainly it didn't define what I did with my life because I could have been in pretty much any major and did most of what I've done in terms of flying jets and such. And, and I say this with all you know, kind of, it's all been refreshed for me as I've got a, a college freshman sitting in a room behind me over here. And uh, I've got an eighth grader downstairs uh, that's starting to think about what she wants to do when she goes to college. And, and I think the important, you know, George said it right, that pretty much any skill set is a part of the mix um, out there. But I guess what I would throw out there is it's, it's less about what you go pick in terms of the curriculum you go do and what school you go do it at than it is about learning how to think critically and ask good questions and build good plans, uh, being a lifelong learner so that as things change, you can adapt with that. And then learning how to work in an interdisciplinary team, because like George mentioned, you know, uh, doing a lot of program management since I left flying, you know, you have program managers, you have engineers, you have people that do tests, you have your contracts folks and your lawyers and your financial folks, and guess what? They all have to get along to get the, the product out to the field on time and on budget and with the capability it's supposed to have. And, and so it's a team effort that any one of those, any way you go, you can be part of that. And Captain Hill, on that note, um, I guess, you know, we talk a lot about knowledge and education uh, when it comes to picking a career, but for, from my perspective, I see a lot of soft skills that make people more successful and dealing with it, as many recruits and trainees, I can only imagine either from, from the recruits or trainees perspective, or even in designing the training, what soft skills do you see aside from critical thinking that really separate people as being successful in their career? Yeah, that's a great point, Paul. And in fact, that's one of the conversations I had with my now freshman as she was trying to figure things out that, you know, so as you said, critical thinking, I think leadership is another one, you know, that you talked about with George a second ago, but I want to make sure there's a point on that, that, that being a good leader, sometimes being a good follower and knowing when it's time to do that uh, and stuff, not everybody can lead every day. And even the leader's not always the leader uh, on a given day. 
And then I guess the third one I'd throw out there would be communication skills, the ability to maybe adapt your message. Uh, like I'll, I'll tell a personal example. One of the things that they taught us when I went to the Navy's test pilot school years ago, uh, and most of us that go through that school are have an engineering background, uh, but we all can't, we all have a thousand hours of aviation under our belt when we get there. And they're like, hey, you're you're coming here to learn how to translate between the fleet aviators over here and the engineers over here so you can figure out what really needs to find its way out to the fleet. And is it, is it working all right? And that translating ability, I think any of us that work in, t- in the tech world would say that's a huge thing. The ability to kind of adapt your message for who it is you're talking to and not be lying. Just tell them what they need to hear in the way they need to hear it to move forward. Yeah, and I think I would add just on the whole adaptability issue. Um, you know, when I started my career, this 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 sector didn't barely existed. Um, you know, our kids will go through I don't know how many job changes and career changes, and I really think that they, you know, those with the ability to communicate, um, both you know, in terms of writing well and well as uh, you know, talking to people, you know, that's that's you know, hopefully not going to become a lost art because technology can't run everything. Um, You know, people have to learn to influence people. And um, I think that'll be really important for for this generation going forward. With with that, George, I want to ask you a question, which is a theme that's intertwined through everything we're talking about. But I'm going to reverse the discussion. A lot of folks don't realize, especially what's happening here where we're at, and you you touched on it a different way, the role of uh, local and state government uh, to support the military and build the industry? Sure. Um, we are very, very fortunate here. Um, as I mentioned on the one slide where I had the picture of all the partnership buildings, um, quite frankly, if the state hadn't have stepped up and contributed the money to either buy or build those buildings, we probably would have lost a lot of this military operation. Um, you know, I define this, we hear about public-private partnerships. This is sort of a public-public-private partnership. Um, It's the federal government, it's the state and local government, and it's the industry that comes in and and has built all this and worked together. Um, Not only the state government, the local uh, county government here has really championed uh, this industry for a number of reasons. One being, quite frankly, that uh, we are so reliant on the tourism business here, which is a great thing. We all love the tourism business, produces a lot of jobs, brings a lot of visitors, gives us a lot of growth and recognition. But when we get a downturn in the economy, you know, we have our high, our, we have our highest highs when things are good and our lowest lows when things are bad. And every time we have hit in the downturn in the economy, we always have our community leaders to say, um, you know, if we weren't just so reliant on this tourism industry, we have to do something about it. Well, I will give them credit this year. They, you know, with COVID, they uh, are stepping up and, you know, putting their, uh, their wallet where their mouth is, and they are just devoting resources to, further uh, diversifying our economy here. So we've been uh, very, very fortunate that way. And, and why do either of you feel like, I mean, tech in the last, even, I mean, I grew up in Florida and the growth of Orlando has been impressive, incredible uh, over the last 20 years, at least that I've seen. And why do you both feel that it's happening in Orlando specifically? I know we mentioned government help, the, the location of the universities, but what are the reasons are there for that tech explosion in Orlando? Yeah. A lot of that I think is theme oriented. This may sound crazy to you guys, but there's a lot of things going on in Orlando. I, I usually don't mention what I do, but one of the things that I will be working on in the near future is another theme oriented uh, scenario with the world's tallest vertical, uh, you know, vertical roller coaster, and uh, you know, also with Lion Gate and uh, you know the virtual experiences regarding some of their movies like Hunger, Ga- uh, Hunger Games and uh, John Wick. So. Uh, it goes back, I think, to, uh, to what was indicated by, by uh, Captain Hill also in terms of the uh, of regular industry expenditures versus military. So you have this high concentration of all these folks who are really into uh, simulation and modeling. Am, am I wrong on this or, or what, guys? No, you're, you're, you're 100% right. I mean, what, what happened in, you know, the, the Battle Stations 21 example is perfect of this. You know, is, there's that, that theme park engineering group and they develop all the rides and toys and uh, attractions. A lot of that same technology goes on with the military. Um, We have EA sports here where all the game development goes on. Um, And what you're seeing both from an industry development, but also from an, from an employee development is that 
it's creating that talent base here where, um, you know, it makes sense for these industries to want to be here. Um, you know, the knock on Central Florida has always been, well, you don't have the big VC firms, you don't have all the capital. You know what? Money finds good deals, um, whether it's from New York or California or for, from wherever, and that's what's happening here. Um, I think, quite frankly, COVID has, uh, has helped the, uh, the growth of money coming from, uh, you know, Lewis, Lewis and Paul's area to here. But um, <laughs> you know, we, we, see, we see that, uh, you know, Orlando is really becoming known for the simulation and training. You know, I, we, mar- we remarked before this uh, meeting started that um, we would always have consultants that would come in and say, you know, if you want to be the next Silicon Valley or the next New York or the next Boston, you need to do this, that and the other. And basically what's coming out of this is we have the, the um, key strategic talent that we need here. Um, we need to be the, the future Orlando, and that will uh, take care of itself. I'll pile on a little bit with a, maybe a different perspective of it. I agree wholeheartedly with everything George said, um, but I'll tell you just from a personal perspective, you know, for a long time, my wife and I looked at, you know, where we might want to land, you know, at the end of the road for us. And, and for a long time, we always said that it would probably be Tampa or Orlando, uh, largely because we both love Florida and my wife's of Jacksonville native. Uh, so we were going to, we were going to find our way back to Florida And the knock we always heard on Orlando, uh, again, not having gotten to live here until we moved here for this tour, was that it was a really transitory society, a lot of move in, move out kind of stuff. Well, what we found when we got here, a lot of people talked about how welcoming Orlando is. Uh, And I don't know how much of that's the hospitality industry, how much of it is the the transitory nature of things or what, but it's totally true. People are very welcoming, but more importantly, you know, Dr. Hitt coined for UCF the term the partnership university. We certainly have the partnership, you know, buildings. Team Orlando is built on a partnership. In fact, as George mentioned, the longest partnership that exists across all of DOD between my command and the Army command that's here uh, and such. So it's this whole notion about anybody being willing to talk to anybody in a manner that, that might spark collaboration uh, and such and use things in, in very in unconventional ways that just seems to be a bit of the magic that we have going on here. And then you partner that with the fact that you got, you know, theme parks out to the West side, you've got rocket ships and, and bombers being built out to the East on the East coast. And then in the middle, you know, us doing our modeling and simulation thing, it's a pretty unique environment from a tech perspective in terms of all that's going on. So uh, t- to me, there's a, a little bit of a secret formula there that seems to be working out. All right. Yeah. Not to mention it's 80 degrees and sunny today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it, it's quite amazing to see. I, I was wondering, there's two things really hot right now, cyber and space. So if one of you or the other could talk to cyber or space command, whichever you choose. I guess I'll talk a little bit about space because both of us were involved in, uh, you know, a bunch of different cities around the country put in a bid for Space Force headquarters. Um, as most of you know, uh, Huntsville, Alabama was selected to get that award. Um, but there is a whole other set of, uh, space force assets that, uh, we feel probably belongs here better. Um, star command, which is a simulation and training command of the, uh, makes a perfect fit for Orlando, as well as some of the university aspects that will be created with space force, you know, sort of the same way they do it in the, in the air force. Um, so, and obviously our, our, uh, research park is a 40 minute drive from Cape Canaveral. Um, and so there's a lot of synergies there, um, on the cyber piece, um, we have now this, uh, army cyber, uh, training facility that we have here, which is a, a huge deal. We have some world-class cyber companies that have relocated to Florida from uh, all over the country to to work out of here. Um, I think the fact that, you know, silver lining of COVID, people have realized you can live anywhere and work anywhere. Um, You know, I was talking to the uh, president of the Florida Chamber of Commerce at a meeting they had a few months ago, and they were talking about how the rural areas of Florida, people are moving in from all over the country. They're buying 50 acres of land. They want to be in the middle of nowhere, and they are some of the most talented individuals uh, and, quite frankly, deep-pocketed individuals 
you know, that you can imagine that are bringing really increasing the talent level here. Yeah, I'll, I'll touch on those a little bit too. One, um, I, I think that some of the, the, the changes in what we're seeing out on the East Coast, the Space Coast, uh, with respect to space are, are healthy for us and healthy in terms of, uh, I, I think, from what I've understood from those in my command and, and others around in t- inside of Team Orlando, um, th- there's never been a really good bond, if you will, uh, between uh, the folks out at the Space Coast and the folks here doing modeling, simulation, and training. Uh, it's just never, we've, there's been different efforts to try to connect, make a better connection there, but it hasn't taken. I think some of the stuff that's, that's happening out there now and some of the things that's happening inside of DOD, like I mentioned with the trying to reach out to non-traditional uh, uh, innovators and such, I think there's a pretty good chance that we might have a, an opportunity for that graft to take finally. Uh, and, and pull us closer together because we have a lot of things that work for the same purposes, just for a different notion of use on the end of the use case. And then the other part, you know, cyber, you know, folks will typically think about um, the typical cyber warrior, you know, the, the folks that are trying to hack a network or defend a network and such. And as George mentioned, our Army uh, component of Team Orlando is the executive agent for the persistent cyber training environment for the DOD, which includes the National Cyber Range that's headquartered here in Orlando by one of our industry partners just down the road. Um, that's the, the traditional stuff. I think there's a lot of work to do in what we inside our command like to call cyber for others. So as the, the knuckle dragon hornet guy, you know, F-18 guy out there, uh, that you know isn't a cyber warrior by profession and such. I'd say, how do you teach somebody to recognize when they're under cyber attack versus when their machine just isn't working that day uh, or whatever? And, and so that kind of stuff. There's a lot of upside, and I think there's a lot of effort that's starting to go into that. The other part is, you know, those cyber warriors tend to operate on closed networks for good reason uh, for, for practicing their things because we don't want them to mess up the real network. Uh, and such. So how do we put on the real network some effects that make the other, again, right. cyber for others, the right. folks that are the operators out there understand what it looks like when they're being cybered. And, and we've been, done some work in that regard too. again, kind of hearkening back to that science of learning that we're so steeped in. And I mean, one, maybe on the note of cyber, but um, I've noticed at least a common theme with professional planning and career planning Sometimes it's about understanding where the industry is, but it's also about understanding where it's going to be. So from both of your perspective, where do you, what do you think the next big opportunity is in this industry? Akta, why don't you go ahead from the defense side? Yeah, I think for us, it's, there's a, I think there's maybe two core things underneath that are really, uh, that, that are like next thing, not the things that I kind of mentioned as the trends with AR and VR and gaming technology. Those are kind of the, they are, and they're being introduced. I think one is the, the notion of, of more open architecture, which is not a new thing. It's just, we have an, a, a greater ability to do it now that'll allow us to move faster and make ourselves more interoperable like I mentioned, you know, as it related to different platforms training together and, and it, it, that, that same thing helps us with cyber because then you can build a common core that has cyber kind of inherent in it and then build out from there. And you, what you have to worry about is different at that point. Uh, I think that's one place where things are going. And, and then the other one is how we take other novel technologies that are being used in other places. They're, they're the here's, uh, they're not the, the tomorrows, but how do we use them in our training? So like what I mentioned earlier with uh, uh, embedded data analytics and AI to really let an, a, you know, an intelligent AI figure out what you need to see to be trained to the best you can be. Uh, that those are going to be hard problems to solve because we don't have, you know, we're not Amazon or Google or one of the big companies that has a data lake already. In fact, we've done a lot of things to not create a data lake over the years. And so then how do we take the things we have and build on the new things to make it converge, to have that vision of being able to have a secure data lake out there and do some of those things with, I think those are, you know, not too far out, but but a little further out than some of those things I mentioned in my pitch. George, over to you. 
Yeah, I'll just add a couple things. One is on the medical side. Um, we've made some great advancements as far as medical simulation to be used for training. We're just now starting to scratch the surface on that. Um, if you want to get a, uh, some really cool ideas of how 3D medical imaging and all that is used on a simulation basis to handle uh, medical cases, um, check out the IXL Center at the University of Nebraska Medical College. They've just built a new facility there that is incredible on in how they use simulation to not only train medical professionals, but also treat disease and, and, and really study disease. And, um, you know, all the way down to uh, how they're using it to uh, analyze what's going on with COVID. Um, on the, uh, you know, Captain Hill mentioned artificial intelligence, the digital twin technologies, the data analytics, you're going to see a lot in the future with smart cities. You know, that's all being used with autonomous vehicles, air taxis, um, it's coming sooner than you think. And, uh, on, on one hand, it's a little scary. On the other hand, it's a little really exciting. Um, you know, but they have to build that infrastructure in each of the metropolitan areas. And if it's not done correctly, um, you know, you'll go back and look at pictures from the fifties and sixties when electric pole, electric, uh, transmission was at its full throttle with all the uh, light poles everywhere. And then we added cable wire to it and then we added all and then we're just, you know, it was urban blight. Um, we don't want that to happen again. So, um, you know, there's a number of initiatives going on so we can use that sensor technology and reduce the, uh, you know, the, the ugly footprint on our environment. And, uh, but a lot of things will be captured uh, everywhere. So, um, you know, there's good and bad to all that. I'm gonna flip back to the business discussion because it's a, it's a constant discussion in industry po's and processing and whatnot so captain hill uh to, what is the, what is the navy and dod doing to make make it, make it easier for companies to work with them so we talked about they are but in your view what are they actually doing operationally yeah i think so first and foremost outreach is is a big part of that you know how, how do we reach out to those companies and make sure they know what we are who we are um, the money behind us and how to work with us. That, that's something that has been ongoing, but like, you know, George mentioned in his pitch, we're kind of cranking up the volume on that. Um, Congress has done some favors for us over the past several years, uh, starting in uh, really F the, the latter part of 2016 with the uh, different authorities that they've given us. And really it's been less about new authorities than expanding authorities we already had. And, and they, they've allowed us to take some existing contractual vehicles that we had that are very flexible and very low overhead on a company and use those to move forward. One of those is the uh, what we call other transaction authorities uh, here locally. The our, our army uh, counterpart has been very active with those, and, and that's all about grabbing non you know a lot of non traditional things or participants and potentially some uh, uh, traditional, you know, big companies as well and building prototypes quickly and down selecting to, to understand your requirements that much better, you know, kind of the, the proverbial throwing spaghetti against the wall sort of thing. Uh, there's been some uh, additional types of money thrown into uh, things like price challenges and those sort of hack events and those sorts of things that have, uh, that have really kind of helped us again to, to what I'll call prime that pump early so that you can bring a company that maybe doesn't have a lot of cash along with it and, and such into the, into the, uh, the sphere with us and not one of the problems we had before. So the, the typical way we would bring a small company in would be through an SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research. And, and those vehicles take a long time to pay out. And so in some cases we can kill a company by starving it for cash while it's, it's got a contract, but it's, and it's, and it's supposed to perform to it, but it hasn't been paid yet. We're going to pay it. The government, the government always cap, you know, you can always cash a check from the government, but <laughs> the timeliness of it sometimes isn't there. And so working those kinds of things, matchmaking between uh, those innovators and non-traditional companies and some of the people that are already in our space, the big established folks like your Lockheeds mm -hmm. and Raytheons, those are other ways. So, I mean, Kind of that's the general landscape of what we're talking about. Yep. Yeah, I'll also throw in, I know, uh, you know, we, we haven't talked about the Air Force much. They have basically something that's very, it's, it's a Shark Tank event every year. And uh, I think two years ago, Mark Cuban, the owner of the uh, Dallas Mavericks came and, uh, 
you know, headed that up. And uh, I think they had Elon Musk last year, but they're really out, you know, they're all out there trying to get, you know, new entrepreneurs and new ideas. The, the Air Force is definitely doing some interesting things. Very interesting. So the, uh, in your view, uh, we're talking about moving ahead. We said Orlando being Orlando. What does that mean to both of you? I know what it means to me because I'm here, but what is, what is that growing in Orlando being Orlando? What does that mean to you? Well, I'll talk about it from two standpoints. Um, one, Orlando in terms of the, the simulation industry and the tech community. Um, I think that's a, uh, a maturing but growing business that has a lot of core competencies that we should take advantage of. Um, having grown up in Orlando, and, and uh, you know, living in the culture here. Um, in the past, it's been a, a city that's been relatively slow to change. Um, I think that's changing now. I think, uh, you know, momentum has taken hold and, um, um, you know, there's a lot of good things going on and, and, and leadership is seeing that. But um, I really think if we uh, really focus on what this industry has to offer as well as combining it with the other industries like the entertainment industry, quite frankly, uh, you know, even the real estate community. I mean, you know, we had to, we had to buy buildings to get this thing going, but there's, yeah. you know, the way that people live and work is going to change. And I think, you know, we have enough of an open book here where um, there's flexibility for that to happen and it's affordable for people to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll hit it from uh, two perspectives. First, uh, professionally, uh, I think uh, part of it is for Team Orlando, we'll be continue doing what we've been doing, um, continue to increase, you know, at a marginal rate, our number of partnerships and our, our participation with other entities around the DOD, um, and, and frankly, be willing to to coach others on, on how our collaboration has been effective, and we've done a, a pretty good amount of that. From uh, the, the uh, additionally on the professional side, for us, TechBridge is a game changer for us. And, and I didn't talk about this part in my pitch in that TechBridge is run out of the Secretary of the Navy's office. And so it takes a command like mine that's pretty far down the organization and creates a direct connection to the top of the organization. You know, and, and there's some goods to that in that you know, it, it allows us to short circuit things. The potential downside is now you've got a spotlight on you from way up in the stratosphere, which I think is good too, personally, because I think it challenges you a lot of times. But the other part of that network, that ecosystems of ecosystems thing, to date, you know, up until last year when we, you know, or excuse me, year before last, when we became a tech bridge and started thinking this way and such, you know, if, if it didn't have something to do with modeling, simulation and training, blinders on um, right. and, and we didn't really notice it much out there now with that whole notion that we may have something in our ecosystem that would be applicable to another tech bridges problem set we have a, a mandate now to hop up on our soapbox pull out our megaphone and scream at the top of our lungs to let somebody know hey this this capability that exists right here in central florida may be something you want to look at and we look at that, we have a, an advanced uh, microconductor uh, factory or facility here in town called Bridge. Uh, that's, it's got some DOD contracts and, and such, and that's a capability that we don't need in training systems, but the DOD absolutely needs. Yep. Um, you know, I, I use uh, uh, Jason Eichenholz here with Luminar as a good friend, and, uh, and they have some groundbreaking uh, LIDAR sensors that they have. We don't need that in training systems, but I will be willing to bet there's a user in DOD that does. And so again, megaphone out. Uh, yep. So those are things that I think are different going forward. And, and then personally for me, as, as I've shared, you know, before Eric, you know, this summer will be when I uh, hang up the uniform and uh, start wearing a coat and tie or polo or something like that to work uh, in, in a non-Navy job. <laughs> Yep. And for me, it means we're staying right here and we're going to join in with the, uh, the fun here in Orlando uh, because we believe in what's going on. Uh, gentlemen, this, is, this has been a, a fantastic, uh, great conversation. And uh, thank you all and a well-deserved uh, congratulations, really, to our, our panelists, uh, Captain uh, Timothy Hill and George Sheros. 
and our moderators, uh, Eric Hill and Paul Pavlakos, uh, for this amazing, really amazing, unique, timely, and highly uh, relevant uh, panel discussion during this particular week, uh, Engineers Week. Uh, we hope uh, that this discussion adds uh, to the needed and ongoing conversation on this very important, timely topic. A thank you and a shout out to our associates for this event, uh, Florida's prestigious Plato Academy Charter Schools, the Ahepa family, uh, Sons of Pericles and Maids of Athena, and Greece, New York. Uh, for those uh, interested in our business and cultural events, please visit our site at www.embca.com and subscribe to our EMCA YouTube channel, uh, which is at no cost uh, for unique content uh, and recorded events and also future event listings. For those interested in joining AHEPA, the international uh, uh, champions of promoting Hellenism, uh, please go to ahepa.org on the net. For those who are looking for uh, model education institutions uh, to have their children attend or to emulate, please follow Florida's uh, Plato Academy Charter Schools at uh, platoacademy.net, uh, platoacademy.net. Uh, finally, thank you to our audience for joining us today and join us for next week's uh, event called the Legacy of the Hellenic Diaspora in the Revolution of 1821. Uh, this event will be in association with AHEPA's Hellenic Cultural Commission and the Hellenic American National Council. I will moderate the panel uh, and also present, and our distinguished uh, panelists will include historian, author, professor, Alexander Kitroff of Haverford College, author writer, uh, Alexander Belenis, and author poet, uh, Professor Nicholas Alexiou of uh, Queens College. Thank you to our panel. Thank you to our, uh, our uh, moderators. Everyone stay safe and see you next week. Thank you and take care. And gentlemen, this was great. And we're going to continue with, with these type of events and dig in a little bit deeper in, in those future events. Thank you again, all. Thank you both. Thank you, Thank you for having us. We Thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you and take care.